everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Getting Past No at the USPTO, The Mechanics for Speeding Up Allowances. I am Gail Martin, Associate Man Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP. I want to cover a couple of things before we start. Please feel free to submit your questions during the conference by using the Q&A or chat feature. You can download a copy of the slides from today's presentation from the GoToWebinar panel. These and a link to the recording from today's presentation will also be sent to you. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jean Quinn. Jean is the founder of IPWatchdog.com, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Jean was recently named one of the world's leading IP strategists by IAM for the second consecutive year. Stephen Coonan. Stephen is a partner at Mayer & Mayer PLCC, PLLC, where he specializes in all areas of patent practice. He held many significant positions within the USPTO, which culminated with 10 years of service as the Deputy Commissioner. His expertise includes post-issuant proceedings at the USPTO, opinions of counsel, advising attorneys, and our clients on complex patent prosecution matters patent litigation strategy, and United States Patent Office patent policy, practice and procedure for which he is highly sought after for expert testimony. Over the course of his career, he has received many notable awards and was named one of Intellectual Properties Today's most influential people in IP law and one of Managing Intellectual Properties IP stars. Rounding out the panel is Megan McLaughlin, Megan is a patent attorney and the product director for Patent Advisor, a suite of patent prosecution management tools. Matt and Megan has a BS in bioengineering from Rice and a JD from Harvard Law. Thank you again for attending today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gene. Thanks a lot, Gail. I appreciate it. And I really appreciate you all spending a part of your Thursday here with us. Um, and we thank Steve and Megan for being here with us today. Had a lot of people sign up for this webinar and a lot of interest, and I think I know why. So let's just kind of get to it. I have a couple preliminary matters. As Gail mentioned, you're all going to get a copy of the um, the recording for the webinar. And if you want a copy of the slides right here, right now, if you're using the Go to Webinar control panel to listen to this on your computer, you can find the handouts tab and click on that and then download. We have two handouts for you. One of the handouts is this PowerPoint presentation. So feel free to download that. It will also be emailed to you. I know a number of you are probably in a conference room or maybe in a classroom at a law school and maybe only one of you actually registered. So only the person who registered will get the access, but that person, please feel free to share with any of those folks who are in attendance. Next is we have another webinar scheduled for next Thursday with LexisNexis IP. And this is gonna be an interesting conversation on identifying non-traditional competitors and spotting aliens in traditional technologies. And this is really a hot topic. We've seen this in the banking industry where Silicon Valley started stepping on the banks and we're starting to now see it in the automotive industry quite a bit, particularly with respect to autonomous driving. And that's what we're going to look at specifically next week. And how do you see when non-traditional competitors are starting to in innovate in your space? And we have a very special guest from uh, the Swiss Patent Office will be joining us. Dr. Spock from the Swiss Patent Office will be one of our guests next week. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that as well. So panelists, what we're going to do is we're going to pause here if we can for, this is the outline. I don't really probably need to go through it. You've all seen it. You know what we're going to talk about, but this is really kind of part two. And I say kind of part two to a webinar we did last uh, year in December when uh, Todd Dickinson joined us. And what we did is we, we set up the the and discuss the reality that certain examiners move at different paces and we'll we'll reset that table quickly in this webinar here but what and then we laid the table for here's some strategies that you can use to kind of try and speed things up this webinar we're going to reverse it we're going to go and really dig into the nuances of how you actually can and what the rules are for and where the pitfalls are 
with respect to the processes for speeding things up at the patent office. So I want to bring in the panel now, Steve, I, I'd like to ask you this question and Megan, I'm going to ask you the same question. Before we start to go through the substantive slides, I'd like to give you a minute or so to talk about the big broad theme or what thing you would like everybody to have in their mind as we approach this topic today. Steve, go ahead. Okay, okay. thank you, Gene. Um, you have to recognize, and you've spoken to it already, Gene, that um, the pendencies to first office action and total pendencies uh, in the Patent and Trademark Office uh, vary greatly um, at the uh, technology center as well as the art unit level and perhaps even dockets within art units. And for fast moving technologies where they can be more rapidly becoming obsolete, patents um, are usually needed earlier rather than later, but things are kind of flip flop because those are the areas where the demand and the workload is the highest. And because of high pendency, you're not getting um, the uh, initial examination as early as you would like. And then of course, the uh, compounding effect is um, how long does it take once examination takes place at the beginning until you ultimately can get your application allowed. And we know that in some areas, um, applicants have to go through multiple RCEs. Uh, in some areas, you're uh, in a area where there's a large number of actions per disposal, well in excess of 2.4. And that really hurts in areas where um, you need uh, your patent um, more quickly, both for initial examination as well as ultimate issuance. Okay, thanks, thanks, Steve. Now, Megan, your your, your initial thoughts on, on this topic. Yep. So, so echoing Steve, there's there can be some pretty significant outcome variability um, at the U.S. Patent Office. Um, but what I hope people take away from today um, are some some new tools in their toolbox uh, to help address this. And and specifically, I'm going to be talking about technology and and data that can help you with some of these issues. And, and I know that there's there's still some reluctance in the legal community to accept some of these these new tools, um, but I'm hoping that people come away from today thinking that, or at least being slightly convinced that maybe some of this technology is necessary because of the outcome variability that exists. Yeah, I I, I think it is personally, and I think you will hopefully come to that conclusion because I think the unfortunate part of patent practices is there is outcome variability and maybe that shouldn't be shocking given that there's 8,500 examiners um, and the the PTO has a lot of things on its plate and right now including this looming government shutdown and I say looming because the government is shut down the PTO is still going but at some point the PTO is going to run out of money and that's probably a different conversation for a different day. But uh, when you have such a big organization, the fact that there is variability shouldn't be shocking. And I know, Megan, we've got a couple slides here to get people a little quick perspective. We're not going to relitigate the the entire last webinar, but we want to prime the well. So if you will, please. Right. Yeah. And like, and I want to echo what Jean said that um, none of none of this data is meant to be an indictment of the USPTO. It's an organization made up of people and people are different uh, and so and and so you're going to see differences in how they practice um, but the differences can be pretty extreme so there was this study that was released in 2012 by pro a professor at the university of west virginia at shine 2 um, what he discovered at that time and, and it's still pretty true today was that um, about 10 percent of the entire examiner applicant pool is granting more than half of patents that come out of the u.s patent office um, so a very small portion of examiners are actually responsible for most of the patents that you see. And on the flip side, only about 20% of patent examiners are responsible for less than 1% of patents coming out of the patent office. So on the flip side, you have these examiners who grant patents incredibly slowly, um, and you have everything in between. And there are, reason, there, there are myriad reasons for this. Of course, you can think of 
you know, there, there's technology differences. Some technologies are more cutting edge. Some of them are subject to 101. There's experience differences. We know that more exam and more experienced examiners are going to be able to move more quickly because they, they've been around. They know what they're doing. Um, but there are also just differences in personalities and outlook that's responsible for this. Um, and I only want to take a minute, if you can go to the next slide, Jean, to talk about how we actually measure this so that you have a baseline for understanding what we think is fast and what we think is slow. Uh, we don't rely on allowance rate for examiners anymore. Um, allowance rate used to be the prevailing metric for examiner behavior. So, um, and it basically that is the percentage of applications they get that turn into patents versus abandonments. Um, but there are problems with this metric. Uh, it doesn't incorporate pending applications. We all know that abandonments aren't necessarily because of the examiner. Um, and for an examiner who doesn't have that many final dispositions yet, allowance rate is frankly kind of useless. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, Jean, we've, um, we've developed a new metric called ETA that we feel is a much better way of thinking about examiner behavior. And whenever I talk about examiner behavior from here on out, I'm referring to this metric. So at its core, um, what ETA is, is the ratio of the total number of office actions to total number allow of allowances. And basically what it's talking about is, what is the examiner doing every day when he or she, sh she sits down at their desk? Um, are they writing office actions? Um, are they issuing allowances? So for example, um, an ETA of two, which is pretty good, and you really only see with experienced examiners, um, means that every day they write two office actions for one allowance across all of their docket. Um, and we have found this factor to be highly predictive of prosecution tendency. Now, if you go to the next slide, what you'll see that's so interesting is, is how, oh, this, this, is based, this next slide is just saying basically that, that ETA is much more reliable than allowance rate, because for any given ETA, you can have a pretty wide range of allowance rates. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I trust the allowance rate score, at least when dealing with examiners anymore after, after I saw this graph. Um, but if you can go on to the next slide, Jean, um, I think someone has some animation. There it goes. Um, what's interesting is how this is, this ETA score is distributed across the patent office. Um, so if you look at it overall, it is kind of a bell curve. Um, and I think that's what you'd expect. Right, so about 50% of examiners are in what I'll call the yellow or normal range. These are average speed patent granters. And then about 30% um, are what we'll call green or fast patent granters. And then about 25% are in the red range. But while it looks like this bell curve overall, if you look at the patent office, it can vary significantly depending on where you are in the patent office. Even, even at the art unit level. I mean, adjacent art units can look very, very different. Um, and this is just an example, not surprising to anyone. In 2800, we tend to have way more fast patent granters. In 3600, you tend to have more slow patent granters. Um, but like I said, this, this, if you really dig down into the art unit level, you can find some significant variability there. So this is all well and good, but you know, what do you what, what are patent practitioners supposed to do about this and and in particular what you, you know what are you supposed to do when you end up when your application is assigned to a patent examiner that you come to find out is in the red zone and so that's what we want to take the rest of the day to to talk about yeah and the first question that i always get is can you cause a new examiner to be assigned to your case and Steve, I have seen absolutely no precedent anywhere to see any reason that you can force or provoke the patent office to get a new examiner signed. A am I correct? Do you know of any precedent that would suggest otherwise or any procedure to, to, to get a new examiner? Um, there is no published procedure. The only experiences that I'm personally aware of are ones where um, based upon documentary evidence, you could show that the particular examiner had animus toward a particular company or attorney. Um, and the examiner's office actions would speak for themselves, which would show um, 
there is that form of animus. Um, so you're talking about the rarest of the rare circumstance that involves technology centered director intervention. Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about examiner malfeasance, right? I mean, something that would be employment discipline worthy, correct? It would have to be egregious behavior. Yeah. So I, I, there's just, there's just really not, I mean, there's, there's nothing out there. I mean, it's the same type of thing. I mean, I guess the way that I would make an analogy to it is we, we're probably all familiar with the instance where that one uh, attorney filed a couple um, things at the patent office that were extremely derogatory towards the examiner. In one instance, asking the examiner if the examiner was drunk you know, things like if an examiner went off the rails like that, you know, or started maybe using certain, you know, racial th slurs or, you know, that kind of thing, it, it, absent stuff like that, you're, you're really not going to get a new examiner absent. And then we've also seen the instances where certain examiners have done things that wind up being potentially borderline criminal with submitting false timesheets and then maybe not criminal, but certainly unethical, where there are a couple examiners over the last five years or so were engaging in representation uh, as agents while they were examiners. You know, those kinds of things are the outliers. I mean, but you probably all could understand that, well, that can't happen. The patent office has to intervene in that situation. If you just have an examiner that's constantly telling you no, that's not a situation that's going to get you a new examiner. So that kind of leads us to these, what I, in the first instance, these old fashioned methods. Um, and we're going to talk about more stuff than this, but Steve, in the, in the old days, you would, you would kind of try and maybe provoke a restriction, right? File a couple different inventions in the application and, and hope one of them was going to be maybe like in the medical area, one of them was going to be a method that was going to push you into a different art unit or something like that, right? Yes, if you're familiar with the uh, classification system, it used to be USPC, now it's CPC, but uh, the classification system has technical terms as how cl cases are assigned. There is a uh, Office of Patent Classification with classifiers where um, where there are disputes over where an examina examin an application should be assigned. Uh, there's a, a, a process to, to get them to intervene. But uh, the short answer is you are correct, Gene, that um, the words in the claim and how you claim the invention can direct where the application is going to go. Now, we're going to talk about that some more at the end because there is some new there are some new tools that can help you with that. So that, that old fashioned method you know, is still av available to you. So don't, you know, don't, don't forget it because as a wordsmith, you can kind of try and still route things around the office doing it the old fashioned way where you're just kind of throwing it up against the wall and hoping, and then, you know, arguing and stuff may or may not wind up working. Now there's always the, the, the bias at the office for smaller applications, bite-sized chunks, and they're to some extent encouraging examiners to issue restrictions. So you got that going for you. But um, doing it without any kind of data is still a shot in the dark, I would say. Um, yeah, and I, I have a question on that too. This is sure. something that that I've wondered about, right? Because like you said, later we're going to talk about the tool that, that LexisNexis offers to help you direct your patent application um, or to provoke a particular classification. If you, if, if the patent office classifies your application in a certain way and you object, you know, and maybe now you have this data to suggest that it should have gone somewhere else, can you fight that? Have you ever fought that and, and does it work? Steve? Well, you're you're probably going to get nowhere from the standpoint of um, trying to do that um, up front. Um, you are more likely than not um, in that type of situation uh, based upon a point where you might feel a continuation application is in order where you um, 
change your claim terminology significantly and get essentially a second chance for the application to be reclassified, you'll have some success right. there. But it's highly improbable, especially, especially after examination has um, been uh, mm. started after a search and office actions have been rendered to try to get the case um, reassigned to a different art unit, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah and, and that's yeah, why- so I guess the thing is, oh, go ahead, Gene. Well, that's why, you know, like the next bullet point is, you know, file a continuation with claims redrafted to try and provoke a you yeah. know, different, different treatment. You know, that's always something that people have had available, you know, and, uh, haven't always used it because, you know, it adds an extra expense after the fact, and you still necessarily don't, without any kind of big data, I still wouldn't necessarily know where it would wind up going for sure. And, and patent office still like to some extent likes to keep these things, you know, to, together once they're there, I, unless you really are claiming different things that need to be searched differently by examiners with different skill sets. And that's why the medical is always a good example because different uh, s supervisors have different philosophies, you know, um, can you search the device and the method at the same time without it costing extra time? Um, cause the examiners only get a certain amount of time, but then you could always complain to the hierarchy. Now, Steve, I know patent attorneys still don't like to do that. They've never liked to do that. I always encourage them that if, if you see something that is bizarre, now I'm not saying that you have an examiner that just says no, but if it's really bizarre, you know, if you're dealing with an examiner, you've been assigned to an examiner that just, you, you have reason to know that this examiner has no, hasn't allowed anything for a couple of years. Um, and, or they've, they've told you something that's bizarre. Like I've always, I've heard from many attorneys and people in the computer space examiners have said, I haven't allowed anything since Alice, so I'm not going to start now. I mean, those types of things, I think the commissioner's office needs to hear them. Don't you, Steve? Um, certainly from the perspective of um, where is your entry point uh, where you're going to get the most friendly ear. Um, sometimes um, you may have a a very cooperative SPE, um, and it will work at that level. Uh, sometimes it's such a problem at a policy level, you're you're going to have to elevate it up towards the commissioner for patents. Yeah, so now I, I'm not suggesting that you just rush to the commissioner and go by the proper chain of command, but if you're not getting anywhere, the thing that I've, the commissioner has told me is that he can't fix things that he doesn't know about. So he always encourages me to tell attorneys that if there's something peculiar and you know, you know, what's peculiar because you, you've been doing this for many of you for many years, if not decades, his office is interested in hearing about it. Now that's not to say that he can fix it. It's not to say that he can get involved in any particular case, but these are things that the office can't fix or change procedures or rules or policies if they don't really know what's going on. So the office has got so many moving pieces and parts that if they don't know it, they can't change it or fix it. So I do encourage attorneys that if you can't get any kind of relief through normal processes to consider uh, getting in touch with the commissioner. But now, this is where we get into the real, where the rubber meets the road for us. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to send them in. The first one is the ombudsman. And it sounds like a great program, Steve, until you understand that they can't help you substantively. But that doesn't mean that they can't help at all, right? That's correct. Now, have you ever used the ombudsman program? I've used it. But have, have you used it? And what is your take on it? Um. Again, I think that uh, the ombudsman program is um, best addressed with respect to systemic problems um, at the technology center level. Um, and there, 
Um, if it's not examiner specific, but it's a problem that might be um, as a result of some kind of unpublished policy created within the, the art unit or within the technology center um, that is inconsistent with published PTO practice and procedure, uh, then you know to get the the examiners to follow the correct policy, the ombudsman program um, can be successful. Yeah, and I that's been you know my experience is is if it's a policy or procedure issue you're having with the examiner, the ombudsman can be very successful. And I know a lot of times you know, the office expects what is it twenty four hour callback or something like that, Steve. And a lot of the examiners, you'll leave messages, message after message after message, and you don't get any callback. My experience with the ombudsman program is um, when they tell you they're going to call you, they call you. And if they don't have an answer, they'll call you to let you know they don't have an answer. So I do encourage people to reach out to the ombudsman. Now, you might unfortunately get us told that they can't help you because it is substantive, but... I would think that you'd be better off having them tell you that and because if they can help, they do. And I, and I know people that have used it. And I also know people who've tried to use it and get frustrated because it wasn't helpful. So they're helpful, very helpful if, if they can help. I think that's probably the best way to say it. So st I would start there. Now, the other, the next one that we have in order here is prioritized examination. Um, and we're going to go through a lot of these rules here, but before we do that, I wanted to show you two slides that Megan put together. And I've said for many years that track one is something that clients need to consider. Patent attorneys need to, to really advise their clients to, to use m more because the allowance rate is higher. And here, 3689, that is I st believe still, Megan, right, the lowest allowance rate art unit at the patent office, yeah, or at it's, least it's one of them. the most difficult. No, I think yeah. it is the lowest. Um, at least last I checked, it was. And, so, this, you know, everybody knows that this program helps you get a patent faster, but it helps you get a patent altogether. Right. I mean, um, look at this allowance rate. It's almost double, almost double. Yeah. You know, yeah. and now and again, now that, so you're, it's, you're, you're still only at 14%, but that's a whole heck of a lot better than, than eight. Right. And now, but now that we have Berkheimer and now that we have the latest one-on-one guidance, I think you're going to see 3689 get better. And if the track one is even better, you know, that allowance rate double almost is going to save whoever winds up getting allowed in track one that wouldn't have gotten allowed otherwise, all kinds of money in RCE fees and attorney's fees. So I would think use it. And then the next slide that we have, this one is is obviously an uh, uh, art unit that is a pretty good one to find yourself in, a 72% allowance rate. Um, but track one is, goes up to 98%. I mean, it's virtually guaranteed, it looks like. you know. And look, but look what's been so interesting here, Gene, are the incredibly small numbers. Look how few people have actually used the program. So 15,000 applications in this art unit, uh, 56 people um, decided to use track one. So it, it always, it, it boggles my mind that, that this isn't used more often. I mean, I, I know it's an upfront cost, but when you consider how much you save in RCE fees, you know, how much you're going to gain in patent quality with fewer rounds of negotiation. And, and I've had feedback on this type of statistic before, you know, where I've shown something about how track one improves allowance rate. Some people will say, well, that's kind of self-selecting because you wouldn't file track one unless you knew you had really, really good claims, like really, really novel subject matter. Um, and I, you know, maybe that's a factor. I'll concede that. Um, but I do think it's more, and, and Steve, something you said before the call uh, made, me, made me think that that, that really might, that, that there really is more to this statistic. Um, so Steve, would you mind telling, talking about what you said before the call about um, the types of examiners who tend to work on track one cases? Yeah, and that starts to take us into the nuts and bolts here, Steve. I mean, th that, and that, that really is the big selling point, I think, right, is who are the examiners? Yes, I mean, um, from our 
um, firsthand experience. Um, empirically, um, we've found that uh, it appears because not only people are paying a premium, um, but um, I think there's an overall policy perspective that uh, the office wants to um, really make this program work. And they put, um, at least from what we've seen, um, experienced examiners who are familiar with the technology, w willing to um, have productive two-way interviews uh, to, you know, indicate allowable subject matter. Um, and therefore, it seems from our own experience that uh, you're in a kind of a win-win situation that you're going to get a, a really solid examination quickly uh, and it's worth the price. Yeah, and and I think Steve, you had also said that the, the examiners you get are, ex, are are experienced primary examiners. So these are people that have decision making authority and are not going to have to loop in a speed to get permission to give you the claims that they they feel like they want to give you. You're correct. So I mean, these are just things to consider. Now, Megan, we had a question here about where these uh these charts came from and it's uh that they've never seen this it seems like this is somebody who does use patent advisor is this something that's in patent advisor currently or will be added to patent advisor because he says that um he thinks that showing this to clients would would be very helpful uh you can absolutely get this in the product as it as it is now so um, please feel free to reach out to me and I, I can show you how to do that. Okay, so um, so if you have questions about how you can actually do that or need that, you can reach out to, to Megan offline um, and uh, she'll, she'll show you how to, how to do that. Because I do think when clients see these numbers, then it, 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 it legitimizes the extra expense, which we're going to talk about here. So now the first thing is the goal, Steve, is to get you an answer, not necessarily an allowance. It just turns out that in a lot of these art units, the allowance rate goes up, but you're going to get an answer within 12 months. But there's a lot of real specific rules. Now, I tried to put as many of the basics, so-called, on this slide. Do you want to take us through some of these here? we got a few slides to go through. Yes. So if you're, if you're going to do prioritized examination, you have to do quite a bit up front. Uh, you're doing electronic filing. Uh, there's a specific limitation on the number of independent and total claims. Um, you can use this um, for uh, U.S. national applications, um, and you can use it for RCEs, for at least one RCE. You know, there are certain things you can't use it for, such as design applications, but they all they have their fast-track uh, uh, processing uh, on its own. You can't do it for reissue. Provisionals aren't examined anyway, and re-exam have their own special dispatch. Uh, with respect to um, international applications, you can't use it at the international stage, and you can't use it for national stage entry. Uh, but once you're in national stage entry, you can file an RCE and request prioritized examination. Um, on this particular slide, um, it shows, you know, that if you want to use it from the get-go uh, out of the PCT, you want to file a bypass um, continuation under 111A, um, and you can get prioritized examination at that point. Uh, you're going to need, and not only in pain, your basic search examination and publication fees, the prioritized examination fee. Uh, you're going to have to have your application data sheet uh, meeting the requirements or an inventor's oath or declaration. Uh, that inventor's oath or declaration doesn't have to be submitted on filing if you have the completed ADS. Um, and uh, you know, also what's not on this slide is that you, if you've got Rule 1.52 um, issues, um, then um, those um, can be uh, 
uh, fixed uh, without getting knocked out of um, prioritized examination. Yeah, I think that might be on the on the next slide here. Um, maybe I I thought I had included that, but may, maybe not. Um, um, but you can you if 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 it is dismissed, the applicant can petition. Um, correct. Well, yeah. Well, you yes, you can petition. Also, if there's uh, a deficiency, uh, if you refile on the same day then you can um, cure that. Um, the one thing that isn't on the slide, which I mentioned, is the situation for, you know, when you file an application in other than the English language. Um, oh, right. You right, don't right. get knocked out. You don't get knocked out. If you fail to pay the excess claim fees on filing, you don't get knocked out. That's correct. I'm sorry. I thought what you were talking about was here in number, number eight, which is, um, you can't refile the prioritization request, but since you're doing this on EFS web, if you file something that's missing, you can file that missing piece on the same day, right? Yes. And that's a bit that's a bit peculiar, um, but you just want to make sure that you, you want to make sure the request is complete. Yes. But if you make a mistake, you have until the clock strikes midnight. You're like Cinderella. So, um, and then I, there's a 10,000 application limit. They've never actually hit that limit. Have they, Steve? I've not, I've never seen them hit the limit. Um, they have a place on the website for prioritized examination that gives you kind of the, um, rolling number, um, for the year. Um, and, um, we haven't seen that number exceeded. Yeah. Of 10,000. So I want to go back to this slide here and talk about the fees. So you have to pay all the fees up front at the time of filing. And the fees for prioritization are included in that. And so it's 4000 for a large entity, 2000 for a small entity, and 1000 for a micro entity. Now, I think based on what I've seen in terms of the statistics, in terms of how fast this moves and uh, everything else that I don't think that that adds extra cost. If anything, I think it it's going to reduce the cost using it uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it's going to increase your allowance rate. And then two, um, it seems to me that when both the examiner and the attorney are dealing with the application over a condensed period of time, there's some kind of efficiency dealing with the, what I will call institutionalization of knowledge, maybe, you know, everybody is on the same page and it's not spread out over three, four, five years. Um, have you found that to be helpful when you're using this? Yes. I think, as I said before, it's a win-win situation. Both the applicant and the examiner seem to be highly motivated to reach a meeting of the minds in terms of what it's going to take um for claims to be allowed uh in relationship to you know the limitations in the in the claims as well as you know what um you know the prior art permits as to scope uh so uh for, you know from the you know perspective of um you know this uh program uh, as I indicated before, you know, sometimes you're stuck in a high pendency art unit and it's about the only way you're going to get your application examined early, irrespective of, of your allowance rate um, improvement. But it all comes together from the standpoint of getting um, typically uh, the, the, app, the, the application is examined early, the examiner is motivated and with the applicant um, to move uh, to allowance of 12 months, not merely final rejection. Um, and, uh, you know, typically you seem to get um, a cooperative examiner and high quality examination. Yeah, you know, and what I want to let people know too is, is I don't think this is just for high tech stuff or what you, you might say are um, corporate type inventions. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the 
trials and tribulations of Josh Malone, who's an independent inventor, and he's the inventor of a bunch of balloons. And uh, he's been knocked off, was knocked off by Telebrands, and we can say that because every federal judge that's looked at that case has ruled in his favor um, all along the way. And uh, so every one of his patents covering the bunch of balloons, which is a, a, a device to uh, rapidly fill up water balloons, was track one accelerated. So, and why would that make sense? Well, with with toys, and that, his toy is incredibly popular, and it has, I think it's going to have a staying power for a very long period of time. But with toys and things of that nature, sometimes the 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 marketability of the invention is is quite short. And if there are knockoffs that are in the industry um, or in the pipeline or marketplace rather, and they're taking away from the innovator over a short period of time, then the innovator is going to wind up with nothing. So if your client has come up with something that has potentially a short horizon, you may want to put your foot on the accelerator and prioritize it and get something fast um, so that you can try and keep the knockoffs out of the marketplace for the relevant life of the product. Um, Steve, thoughts on that? You're exactly right. I think it, the point I was making before in terms of the the need to get um, the patent early, it's precisely a, the, the type of situation where you are uh, in anticipation that you're going to need your patent uh, to uh, enforce it in an infringement action. And uh, you can be sitting out there very frustrated if you've got you've got your product on the market other people are putting um the uh, infringing products on and you're still waiting to get your patent um so timing is everything uh, and that's a true uh situation of the need for speed yeah and so think about it if you come across anybody who's been who's put their inventions on one of these uh, boards on the internet in order to c attract funding. Those uh, knockoff folks troll those boards and then try and get their products to market faster than the innovator. So that would be a situation where you might want to recommend to the client when they come to you that they really, really are going to need to move fast if it's something of merit that looks like it's going to have some market success because um, they're going to need to really try and stop that uh, copycat from taking the market share. Uh, all right, so let's move to the next slide. Or Actually, I got a, got a question here, Steve, and it says, are we talking about that for an RCE, a different examiner will be assigned. And we addressed that a little bit earlier on. I don't think that's what, what we're saying, is it? No, it's highly improbable that there will be a different examiner assigned when uh, an RCE is filed. Your greater probability for a different examiner to be assigned would be when a continuation is filed and the continuation uh, in particular would have claims that might necessitate um, further consideration or search, even perhaps uh, classification into an area of uh, the patent classification system that was not really searched. Um, in that particular case, I think you have a much greater chance uh, through the filing of a continuation with the uh, prioritized examination request than merely an RCE. Yeah, and actually, as I think about it, I'm not sure we did address that earlier in this webinar. I know we talked about that in the green room ahead of time. And what we were talking about in the green room ahead of time is just how critically important it is that if you're going to be in one of these art units where there's an awful lot of red examiners, to use the LexisNexis uh, term, you you really are going to want to try and use prioritized examination or the next tool we're going to talk about here 
is going to be the patent prosecution highway because once the examiner gets assigned, it's unlikely they're going to take it from that examiner and put it to somebody else. But with prioritized examination, it's very likely that you're going to get a high quality, very senior examiner from the get go. And once you have that, then any follow on applications that you would file continuations, for example, are likely going to go to that same examiner who's going to have institutional knowledge. So uh, it really is going to pay dividends, I think. Now, looking at the time, we, I want to make sure we talk about this in, in drafting too. Patent Prosecution Highway, this is Toronto Pronto, Steve. You want to talk about what that means, Toronto Pronto, and some of these uh, these rules that can be rather peculiar? Yes. Um, for many years, um, it first started with uh, the International Bureau for PCT Applications, then uh, into uh, the trilateral uh, USPTO, JPO, EPO, and now IP5 um, offices uh, to uh, try to um, leverage the work of the Office of First Filing um, to the benefit of offices of sex, second filing. So here, patent prosecution hi highway is essentially a way to accelerate um, the examination uh, of a, an application in an office of second filing um, where either you're going through the PCT and you're getting what's known as a positive um, IPRP, uh, which then, uh, when you go into the national stage in many countries, um, there are many small offices which will uh, essentially uh, convert that uh, set of claims that have been considered favorably in the international phase uh, for grant of national patents. Also, from the standpoint of Paris route, um, there are, there's the, the global PPH, the IP5, and then bilateral arrangements um, where, again, um, the uh, allowance of claims or the equivalent in the office of um, initial examination or first examination uh, when presented to the office uh, of uh, second filing gives you an opportunity um, to get the accelerated examination. Um, and this can be a very helpful program, not only for uh, the speed of examination, uh, but improving the, the opportunity of getting the um, uh, counterpart application claims allowed um, in uh, offices of second filing. Yeah, and on this side, uh, just so everybody knows, OEE would relate to the office of earlier examination. So depending upon who you're talking to, they'll either refer to it as the office of earlier examination or the office of first filing. But the whole point is, is what you're doing is, is the second office is relying on the work product of the first office. And the reason that this strategy is referred to as Toronto Pronto by some is because Canada issues patents very, very quickly. So if you can file in Canada and get an, uh, an allowance in Canada and then come back to the U.S., um, you can uh, move to the front of the line if you understand the rules and you know how to navigate the PPH here in the U.S. because we have a PPH with Canada. And uh, Todd was telling me, Todd Dickinson was telling me that he knows the one particular company that that's all they do. Everything they do is Toronto Pronto. And that they were getting patents, I think he said, in eight or nine months in the U.S. using Toronto Prano. Um, and the allowance rate, once you get into the patent prosecution highway, is extremely high. It's like 98 or 99 percent. And Steve, it seems to me that it all depends upon whether or not the claims sufficiently correspond. And that's the whole action with the PPH, correct? Yes, because if you're not careful, um, you can get um, uh, denied entry into PPH because you haven't presented only claims that correspond to the allowed claims or um, 
positive IPRP claims in, in an international application in the international phase. And that's why it's critically important uh, to follow um, the PPS, PPH um, rules, uh, not only in terms of use of the form um, that's applicable to which path you take, but also to take the completion of that form very, very um, seriously so that um, you don't get into a tussle with the USPTO in particular with respect to the issue of claim correspondence. Yeah, and there's a couple. And the one thing here with claim correspondence that, that always strikes me as a little bizarre is if you ask for a claim that's more narrow than the one that you ha have received in the Office of Earlier Examination, you can only have it if it, it's a dependent claim. So your independent claim must match up with the independent claim that you were granted in the other office. So if your independent claim that you're seeking in the U.S. is more narrow, you would think logically, well, that's got to correspond because I'm asking for less than I've gotten previously. And it won't. That's not correct. Your independent claim has to match up. And then if you want narrower claims, that's fine, but they have to be dependent claims. Um, and there's a couple other, you know, peculiar things I think about the PPH process. Um, here's the, we have the required documents that are here. And I think, uh, in here, this is a couple of the things that I thought also are a bit p peculiar is you only get one chance to perfect Steve. Um, it's one and done. You either get it right or you, you're okay. Thank you for trying. Yes, um, but again, um, this is a situation where you know you've gotten the benefit of uh, having an examination of a counterpart uh, application, and now that you've had the experience of what it took uh, to get the first application allowed. Um, and you want the fast track, so to speak, uh, in the office of second filing that say, you know, get it right the first time, we'll give you one chance. So there, there's some, you know, a policy uh, component to it that does in some sense um, say, do it right the first time. Yeah, no, and I, I didn't mean to suggest that. I think that that's doesn't, isn't good policy or, or isn't, doesn't make sense, but I do think it's important for attorneys to know this is not one of those types of things at the office where you can file it and then you you want to get it on file and then we can fix it later, which there are things at the office that are like that. You need to get the filing date. This is not one of those things because if it's wrong, you're going to get one chance to perfect it. And if it's wrong, um, the examination is not going to be stayed. So you can only get PPH granted if it is granted before examination begins. Um, so you, ha you have to do this right. The other thing is, is, and this is just to know, it will carry over into, the, uh, into an RCE, but re remember a continuation is a new application. Um, and then any claims that are amended or added to the application or of course are going to have to sufficiently correspond um, otherwise it defeats the entire purpose so the sufficient correspondence is, is a topic that comes up throughout the entire process we have you know, a link here where you can find out where all the countries are who participate um, and there's a couple and again um, a list here of what does not qualify any any final thoughts on pph steve um, well, I think it's important to recognize that there are uh, a number of different um, procedures available to you, um, either at the international stage or um, in office of first filings to get a form of expedited or accelerated examination, which then you can leverage through PPH. So, it's important to recognize that if you really need um, the uh, you know early uh, 
U.S. grant in particular and is uh, an application coming from abroad, um, make sure you use those accelerated or expedited procedures in the Office of First Filing or, or OEE um, to get um, the, uh, the allowance of claims. As you pointed out, uh, PPH doesn't do you any good if you haven't gotten the allowed or favorable I IPRP prior to its filing. Yeah, now we have a question here, Steve. Um, what, and I think I understand what the question is asking, so I'm going to slightly rephrase it. But what if you are in the PPH process with one set of claims from an office of earlier examination, and then you happen to get a better set of claims allowed uh, from that office, maybe, or from a different office? Is is there any mechanism to expand the claims that you're asking for, or is that going to require a new PPH application? Um, well, again, I think um, to a large degree, timing is everything vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the processing at, at the USPTO. Um, you may be in the situation where um, you, you've, got, you've got everything lined up initially, and uh, let's assume, you know, for argument's sake, that you um, don't get a first action allowance. Well, in that particular circumstance, you have an opportunity to uh, respond to the first office action. And then, of course, um, if you've gotten um, some, you know, uh, better claims and you obviously want to satisfy your, your duty of disclosure by filing an IDS, you, know, you leverage that uh, through amendment practice. Um, while staying within the PPH um, at um, essentially the, the reply to the um, first office action, which is not an allowance. Now, in the situation where um, you don't have um, the alignment um, uh, properly, then, of course, you, you might have to um, uh, file additional cases uh, in order for you to take advantage uh, of um, a different, um, you know, PPH first filing outcome. Uh, so the, the short answer is there's a lot of variation, um, and depending on the facts, um, there are different ways that you can accomplish your overall objective. Yeah, it, it depends. And, and timing is everything because these things are going to move really fast. So you you hopefully are going to not have the opportunity really to to need to amend or to amend. But it kind of depends. We're running a little short on time. I want to get to the drafting or at least mention it here, Megan. I, I think we're probably going to have to do a, a separate webinar on this topic to give it justice. But uh, in the few minutes we have remaining, what, what can you tell us about drafting? I mean, the language matters dramatically. It does. And, and I guess if I have to, to, to emphasize one thing, it would be that it's important to be intentional about um, how you draft your application in every tech or in many technology fields. I think that most people think that it's only in software that there are art units that are, I'll say, bad, that you have to avoid. And so people who draft software claims have this in mind when they're drafting, and they have for some time. But um, now that we know what we know about the USPTO and how there are different types of examiners in every single art unit, I think it's important to be intentional about your classification goals in any technology area. So this example here is just for, for a medical device. Um, and for this particular claim, you could end up in 1610, where you have a pretty significant chance of ending up with a red or slow examiner, or 37D, where you actually have a significant chance of ending up with a green or fast examiner. Um, so even before you begin drafting, I think this is an important part of the planning phase. Um, and since we're near the end, Gina, you know, I can already anticipate your question of, of a takeaway for today. 
Um, and, and I would say the one theme that I keep hearing throughout today's discussion is that as early in the process as possible, I mean, before you file, maybe even before you draft, I think that patent practitioners need to be strategic about what about their prosecution strategy. Um, because now that we now that we have all this information at our fingertips about how the USPTO functions, I think it's our responsibility to use that information um, and to use it early in the process to have an intentional drafting um, and filing strategy. Yeah, I, I I can't agree more with that because you know I mean if you see, um, and, and the tools here are are very helpful. You know they have a this keep list, these words that are going to get you likely to where you want to be and the kill list, these words that you want to try and stay away from. And if you know that and you can pre amend your claim before you submit it. Um, I mean, look at that. Look at this, the odds of getting where you want to go dramatically. I mean, just dramatically change, you know, so. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it's tough to do. I mean, it's, you know, when you're drafting claims, there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is one more thing to keep in mind, but look, I mean, if it takes you five extra hours, look at how dramatically you've improved the chances for your client. Yeah. Isn't that worth it? Yeah. And, and if you can show your client this, then, you know, you could probably, uh, as one of the other questions want to know is like, where is this data? Where can I get it? So I can show the client that that can justify perhaps some additional hours of, of, of effort. Um, but Megan, I guess you you beat me to the punch and gave me your your final thoughts, Steve. I want to give you an opportunity. What what's the one or two things you want people to leave remembering today? Well, I think the main thing is the, the notions of um, not only speed and but quality of examination. You know, we you know didn't really talk about the fact with respect to PPH is that you're getting um, multiple examiners from different offices looking at your claims and giving you um, more perspectives on um, the claimed invention. Uh, I think there's a synergistic effect there through the use of PPH. Plus the fact is that when you um, or even in PPH, uh, you know, you can use prioritized examination on the front end or the back end um, through an RCE as well. So they're combinable. Yeah, yeah. Now I really appreciate you guys taking the taking the time here.